Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ryan Taylor, and uh, today I'd like to start by acknowledging that uh, we are uh, uh, that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We recognize that you are all joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So uh, as I said, my name is Ryan Taylor. I'm the Career Planning and Capstone Coordinator for the Master of Data Science in Computational Linguistics. If you are interested in computational linguistics and the Master of Data Science program, then you are definitely at the right place today. Um, before introducing our speakers, I'd like to note that we're going to be having an admissions panel sometime in December. We'll make sure that you know about that. If you're signed up for, uh, for our emails, we'll make sure that you hear about that. Uh, but today, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, we have some former student panelists and a current uh, student. I'd start by um, asking uh, Kamal Mystery to introduce herself. Welcome, Kamal. Hi, Ryan. Uh, so I'm from the first batch of MDSCL and uh, before coming to the program, I actually am from India. So I'm an international student and I have a background in engineering and business intelligence. But one thing that attracted me to CL was that I constantly found myself working with text data. So I felt like CL was a natural choice. Yeah. Great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Celine. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Celine. I'm a current student of MS Computational Linguistic Program. Um, before joining the program, I graduated with a second degree in computer science program um, at UBC. I graduated this year. So before that, um, I am in social science doing research in sustainable food system. Yeah. Great, welcome Celine. And last but certainly not least, Jonathan Chan. Hey. Uh... Yeah, so I'm Jonathan Chen. Um, I was uh, from Canada, so I'm, I guess, like a national student instead of international. Um, my background is environmental systems engineering, and my interest in the Master's of Data Science Computational Linguistics program was kind of like Kamal, um, working with text data and kind of seeing how, um, how it's used in areas such as like policy development for environmental uh, areas and other like interdisciplinary areas as well. So um, yeah, just a general interest in text data was one of my um, particular reasons for applying to the program. Great. Well, I'd like to talk, we're going to be going through questions and uh, these are questions that have been, uh, that will be coming in through the chat. So if you have a, a question, then please put it in the Q and A. And there are a number of questions that have also been uh, asked before uh, before today, and so we'll be answering some of those. Um, and we're going to have lots of great answers, uh, lots of really a lot of, of questions. So, um, first first thing that I'd like to ask is, um, what made you select a master's program versus learning data science online or perhaps in uh, a boot camp? And I'm aware that th this year. Um, uh, 2020, everything is is kind of online anyways. Uh, we'll get to maybe some of the differences that later, but why uh, a master's program as opposed to um, what we traditionally think of as online learning? Cool. Uh, yeah, so actually I think before even coming for the program, I did do a lot of online courses, but I felt like um, it was not structured enough for me personally because I felt like with the MDSCL program, we had so many courses going on, but everything connected. And I've got like the entire like progression and that just helped me learn better. And also the constant support from teachers and TAs that really makes a difference. So yeah, that's why I chose the program. Celine. Um, yeah, so I stayed here before, so I really liked the environment. So I wanted to stay at UVC again for another master degree. Um, in, term, um, in terms of uh, the course uh, content, um, I do take uh, some of the data science classes in undergrad class. So my purpose of uh, choosing this program is because I think the program kind of struck in a way that uh, not only tell you some of the practical skills that use in the industry, but also um, it cover um, some of the data science concept 
to the right level that prepare you to um, understand the concept as well as um, uh, you can apply it later in, in the job. Yeah, I think some a lot of the online classes like Coursera or other platform, the courses they provide doesn't touch um, too much into uh, the concept itself. Um, if they only cover, you know, the data science um, area of the concept. Um, I think our program also provide um, uh, trainings on statistic and uh, language um, perspective. Yeah, I've been attending to uh, some of the coursework that you do, and it's not just about uh, writing the code that uses the statistics, you're also learning about concepts like probability. And Jonathan. Uh, yeah, just kind of building on uh, what the other two panelists were saying. Um, the structure of the program was definitely a major part of the reason why I applied to this program. Um, so sometimes I find for online boot camp kind of courses, uh, they, I guess maybe the sequence of topics that you kind of address, um, it's not so much structured in the way that helps you learn it, in the way that you could use it for work. It just seems like an attractive educational product. It's like, ooh, this is, I, if the course mentions a couple of algorithms or a couple topics that are really interesting, um, like, oh, that seems like how the course is kind of built to attract as many people as possible. Um, a program like this was nice for they kind of start you from the beginning of, you know, just using GitHub. If you're, if you're not familiar with Python and R, um, they kind of start you from base level. It moves quite fast, but um, they start you off from me have not having a computer science background. Um, that was really helpful for me to kind of study from the beginnings of programming and kind of work your way up to higher level data science concepts. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So um, really targeted towards, and of course, as the, the career, uh, career and capstone person in the program, that's something I think about a lot, but it's really taking you from where you're at and then getting you into a career and not just a question of, of trying to get you in the door. Um, one of the things that you, so we were talking about why um, the MDSCL versus something uh, sort of traditional, if you want, online course, why, why a course that's actually at a university. Um, now why, and this is touched on a bit, why UBC? Why um, UBC MDS as opposed to uh, MDS Okanagan or MDS V? What was it that, what made you want to come to uh, UBC MDSCL. We'll start with Kalmo again. Um, so basically, uh, going off of the online courses, before I came to the program, I actually did online courses on different um, areas like NLP and computer vision. But I felt like without the linguistics aspect, mm -hmm. I didn't really understand Maybe I could apply like an algorithm in Python, but I didn't understand what's actually going back behind it. And I feel that that insight is very essential because in data science, you have to keep constantly keep on updating yourself. So if you do not know the basics, it's very likely that you will not understand what is new and coming. So that's basically why I chose the program of MDSCL or MDSV because my constant um, ambition was to work in text data. Right. So there's that, it's interesting that it's coming back tw twice to, to really learning the fundamentals and yeah. just learning the, yeah. and um, was there, was there something about Vancouver and like Vancouver as a place coming to Canada that was attractive to you or, or you thought, you um, just like the program? So uh, I would say the program was definitely the biggest attraction and also, um, just for an international student, I think Canada was attractive, not so much Vancouver because I didn't know too much about it, sure. but I knew that it's a friendly city for international students. And right. basically it's a good place to be. It's just, uh, UBC is great and Vancouver is also really pretty and beautiful. So I think, yeah, that's all that <laughs> went into it. So Celine, um, what mm -hmm. was it about? I mean, you were already studying at UBC, so you, you clearly wanted to, continue at, at UBC, but why, uh, so, you know, answer whatever you'd like about why MDSCL versus MDSV or MDS Okanagan, mm -hmm. and maybe why Vancouver over, over other locations? Yeah, so I think uh, I've been doing, I was doing some research before I apply a uh, master type of program in NLP. I think this is a program that really designed from scratch and tailored to students with diverse backgrounds. Um, 
so um, even if you don't have too uh, strong computer science or engineering background, you can still get a good start here um, and then develop your uh, skill set over the over the 10 months. So I kind of want to learn with, um, you know, students with different backgrounds and maybe I can just learn from um, some of the skill set I'll probably use in the future. For example, I can apply the skill sets in consulting so I can learn with a student from this field. Um, uh, uh, beside that, um, I think um, in terms of uh, Vancouver, the city, um, I can definitely tell whoever wanted to come to Vancouver or UBC, this is the best city in Canada. Um, Cause I have been studying the university um, in like in other era university in, in Waterloo. Um, the, the more than half year winter season really freaks me out. <laughs> um, yeah, in Vancouver, there's a great um, uh, uh, Asian community, different types of food. Um, uh, you can go hiking, running, different kinds of sports uh, almost every weekend. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely a great experience I'm learning here. So, uh, Jonathan, if you uh, be interested to hear your answer, or you could tell us about how Regina is actually the best place. And as a person from the prairies, I'm I'm open to it. <laughs> it's funny, actually. Um, I didn't expect to meet anybody from the University of Regina, but um, one of the TAs, um, Garrett, actually, <laughs> and is from U of R. So it's kind of nice to have like a. Uh, university is close, but um, also, the, I mean, the things that attracted me to the University of uh, British Columbia was um, the fact that it was well respected by, um, like, for, what, like um, Celine um, doing some research in other programs. Right. Um, UBC seemed to be considerably ranked as a pretty high, highly regarded university. Um, uh, but also, asking some friends who studied at UBC, um, they always remarked how UBC seemed very. Uh, academically challenging and, and like a pretty difficult program. And that was part of the reason why I applied as well. I think that data science and the way that it's taught, um, like I, I would like to um, have like that challenge, um, like not, um, you know, I think that if you want to just have a uh, data science boot camp or those sort of courses that are, um, like if you put in any work, it can, it'll still be acceptable. But right. I kind of like the idea of a 10 month program that you were challenged very hard for the entire duration. And, and I think Kamal can attest to it. It was, it was very challenging, but I think right. that we got ultimately uh, the amount of like learning that we've, that we received within like a 10 month, pro within the 10 month duration. It's pretty short, um, but it was very, very um, filling. So. so Kamal, was it important to you that it be, a bit of a challenge too, that it not be just just an easy course. Sure, I think um, I think yeah. I mean, it was challenging, but it was also very intellectually satisfying at the same time. Right. Like, because you normally, I don't think without the program, I wouldn't have pushed myself just as much in that ten month um, uh, period. So I feel like um, even though it was a little difficult. At the end of the 10 months, when I saw my like uh, progression, I was really amazed by that. So I feel overall, it's very intellectually satisfying. So yeah. So just to drill into that a bit, did you, what did you find your, um, you're saying that it was very difficult, but I noticed that you and Jonathan, you know, when we were talking before we started the webinar, you seemed to be quite friendly. So you weren't trying to stab each other in the back at every turn. Mm -hmm. the, what was the interaction like between the different people within the, within the program? So I think uh, with FDSCL, especially um, all of us, we had a smaller class. So I think we had more of like a community and everybody was helping each other out because it was a difficult program. So I think it's best to help each other out than just be in like a silo. So I, I feel like that uh, friendship and just like learning from each other, from your peers, that was very essential to me personally. And I think even for John, I think it was the same. And I, I think that that, um, that teamwork is something that we're quite intentional about, because once you get out into the working world, it's usually not the case that you're working all by yourself. I mean, maybe it's possible that one of you just wants to create an app by yourself. And, but usually in the working world, you're working together. So it's, it's great to, to see that collaboration happening. Now, Celine, you're still in the program. So I have a slightly different question.
question, which is, is I know that there have been some changes made in the program because while we want it to be challenging, we don't want it to be uh, the worst part of your life ever or something. So what, what have you seen with how, how the program has been maybe tweaked a little bit to deal with what's now mostly online learning within classes mm -hmm. and how has that affected things? I think uh, first thing I have to say is I'm really, really impressed by the effective communication that faculty and the teaching staff has been. Um, that we have the student representative from different time zones, uh, majorly one in Asia and one in uh, North America, who are collecting our students' um, opinions and you know suggestions um, uh, for each of the class and they kind of report this opinion constantly to the instructors and the instructor can really adapt to the, you know, the suggestion that we've made uh, very, very quickly. Um, um, secondly, I think the office hours and um, uh, there are multiple office hours um, allocated for each class and then the TAs and the instructors are really, really accessible. So I even got like a responses like at twelve thirty or something like that. So I'm I'm really impressive um, by by that. Um, I I also heard that this year um, some of the classes we have group assignments instead of doing the assignment individually. Um, so um, for example, this block we have four classes. So each of the class have a chance to to work uh, on the assignment with your peers, maybe two or three of them. Um, like uh, uh, one assignment by per, per week. Yeah. I want to go back to something that, um, that you, were, you were hinting at, Jonathan, which is that you had already, uh, it sounded like done a couple of, of these uh, online, um, online uh, massively open online courses or something before coming into the program. So when you, when you came into the program, what, what level of experience do you re recommend that somebody joining the program has? I mean, I, on the one hand, um, the, the program exists to teach you skills, right? The expectation isn't that you come with all of the skills already and that we just sort of give you a rubber stamp to certify that. But on the other hand, it is challenging and it's, you know, you should, when you're applying, have some level of skills. So what, what are your recommendations to people interested in the program? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that someone like someone like me who didn't have a programming background or a CS background in undergrad, um, it's when I got into the program, I found it pretty common for the people who didn't do CS in their undergrad to kind of feel like a little bit in the early months, like kind of, oh, we're, I'm not sure if I'll be prepared for what's coming ahead. Um, and for me, how I prepared was just take, yeah, like taking courses on Coursera, um, Udacity, um, familiarizing myself with like Python, um, GitHub, and SQL. That was about it. Um, maybe taking one or two courses in, in each topic. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that it was uh, a program like this. It always feels like there's something that you're maybe missing. Like you're, you're coming into this program to learn a lot. And uh, that seemed to be pretty common for a lot of the classmates, um, like feeling like there is always more preparing that you could do. Uh, in terms of recommendations, uh, for the MDS CL program specifically, I would say like a solid background in Python would be the most critical thing that a student could do to prepare. Uh, unlike the MDS V program that kind of, I, I think splits like their time between R and Python like yeah. fairly, fairly evenly. Um, in the later months of, of the MDSL program, it's primarily Python and, and it gets pretty, pretty the, the learning curve goes up pretty exponentially. So um, having a good background on just um, basic data structures and just getting fluent with using Python, I think is really important. To uh, Selene and Kamal, do you have anything that you'd like to add to, to that response? Um, yeah, I think I would suggest the same as uh, Jonathan said. Um, you should have like a little bit of a background, at least in Python, if, if you're considering like the MDSCL. Because um, I feel like without a strong background in Python, a lot of the assignments can be challenging and you don't want to spend too much time trying to learn Python fundamentals when you're actually being taught computational linguistics fundamentals. So I think from that aspect, it's very essential. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, 
one of the questions that we're getting is um, if if you get so th this course is really designed to allow people to analyze text and um, not speech, but you know what after you've done the speech recognition, the some the things that uh, that comes out of that. But um, folks are asking, you know, would you be able to do non NLP data science jobs or I mean, would you even want to? But uh, would, is that something that you would see yourself being able to do? Um, especially uh, uh, Kamal and, and Jonathan, but uh, Celine, even though you're in the middle of it, I'm sure that you still, in the middle of the program, I'm sure you'd have something to, to add. So uh, starting with Jonathan, I guess. Yeah, um, so, if the, so while NLP was kind of the area that I was initially interested in in the program, uh, something that I found happened for me and, and some of the other classmates is you end up finding maybe a certain area of it, like throughout your studies, you may, have finding, you may end up finding an area that you end up gravitating towards. It might come easily or you just find it interesting. Um, for me, I liked data visualization. Um, in my capstone project, that was kind of my role in my group was to kind of deal with more of the data visualization side. Um, and we ended up only having about one course um, in the MDSCL program. Um, that's about that. So. Yeah, I think that you can definitely find maybe more standard uh, data science areas that you might want to focus on. Um, and while the program is, I mean, one of the benefits of the program is, is very fast and, and you get through it very quickly. Um, the other, maybe the downside of it is that you, for certain topics like um, SQL or data visualization, if you didn't have um, many courses on it, you might have to end up um, doing some self-learning, which I, I'm personally okay with. Um, if you're, depending on your timeline for how quickly you need to be looking for jobs and stuff, that can be different. But um, yeah, it's definitely possible to find like an area that you kind of want to specialize in that's not related to NLP and whatnot. So um, Kamal, I guess building on that, do you find that, that the course in any way, because you talked about how it really teaches the fundamentals and so do you feel like the course also taught you how to teach yourself data science? Um, yeah, I feel like uh, with the program, just if you, you have to do a lot of self-learning as well to really excel because you can't just like depend on the labs and assignments if you want to get a fuller experience. And um, I feel like there are certain topics that would be introduced to us, but not like we would not deep uh, we would not take a deep dive into it, but it's obviously open uh, for people who are curious. And one such thing would be for us, um, I think we learned about transformers towards the uh, later blocks, and there's a lot happening in the transformer spaces. So that's something that I do on by myself. So I think you have these kind of few topics that you will come across either in NLP or just in like normal data science. Uh, which you can build up upon uh, according to your interest, that is. Celine, have you encountered anything so far in the program that, that you're thinking, oh, I learned a little bit about this, but now I really want to, as soon as I get a free moment, I'm going to go deeper into that. Uh, um, I, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Keeping in mind that, that porcelain is only in block two of the program. So is, uh -huh. have, has there been, you know, what have you learned about so far that you're thinking, oh, this is really cool. I want to find out more about that. Definitely. I think, um, uh, I think, that, okay, so our current blocks are t teaching us to use different kind of a vectorizer to sort of encoding tags. Um, I have heard of that concept before, but I never like, um, there's never a moment that I, I try to push myself to think, oh, what are the common um, different ways of encoding attacks? There are different types of vectorizer. Um, the, uh, some of them are considering sequence, some are, some are not. Um, so I think during the lecture, the instructor, you know, just briefly introduced some of them. And I just keep me thinking, oh, what are some of the other like methods that we could, we could do that? What are the pros and cons? What are the possible scenarios? Um, yes, so it just triggered me. I definitely wanted to go deeper into that, and I sort of uh, helped me to, you know, um, I it just pushed me to ask questions, uh, like in private, to and then just a message instructor to know uh, what I want to know more about this. Oh, that's great. 
It's, yeah. it's great that you're, I can already see your enthusiasm for, for things. Um, yeah, thanks. And I'll, I'll ask you, I'm going to stick with you and ask, um, is the homework doable? We talked about how now there's sort of group projects, but how are you finding that dealing with, with all of the homework, uh, given that the program is so short and so intense? Me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, I feel it's... Uh... Um, okay, I heard uh, a lot of my uh, fellow classmates complaining the program is really intensive. They can, I think they can barely, uh, I, can, I think they can barely finish all the assignments. And then they probably use six days to finish all the assignments and I have a day off um, in a week. Um, but I think that taking the, um, having this group work um, definitely helps to reduce the stress levels. Um, um, for me personally, I think it's uh, uh, still very, very manageable so far, but I think this is still currently blocked too. Um, I heard it's quite, as the time goes, it's, it's getting more intensive. So yeah, so I, um, yeah, I pr probably uh, Kamal and Jonathan have more um, say on this. Yeah, Kamal, uh, what, uh, what were your feelings about the course intensity? Um, yeah, I think, I think the entire week you will just be doing assignments. That's personally what I followed. Um, cause at least like back then, I, I'm not very sure of what the changes have been right now, but because it was individual assignments. So basically you had to make sure that you have completed all of your labs. So there's no, like, um, there was help, but yeah, the workload was uh, significant. So I would say the entire week would be assignments and labs. So, yeah. right. But so did you find that when, when um, in March, we all of a sudden found ourselves uh, kind of in lockdown, did mm -hmm. you find that, that there was no adaptation or, or was there consideration given for the fact that circumstances had changed? Yeah, there were definitely uh, some relaxations because um, I guess before, like uh, when we were talking before the panel started, we used to actually spend a lot of time um, on campus together and like everybody is around and helping each other out. So I think that aspect was missing after the COVID uh, thing happened. So definitely even the TAs were giving us more time and attention uh, along with the professors. And there were a few relaxations in terms of the workload and sometimes even deadlines. So yeah. Jonathan, what did you feel about the workload within the course? Yeah, one thing that inevitably came up in um, studying on campus, but also studying with the MDSV program, was that uh, there's a fairly different, I guess, maybe te teaching methodology uh, in terms of um, MDSV, their, their exams and their quizzes uh, were open book, whereas ours were closed book. And that really changed, it's, it seemed like it changed how like a given week would go for MDSV students versus MDSCL students. Um, we often had, on top of finishing assignments, um, had to schedule in a little bit of like uh, of formalized studying time. Um, whereas some of the MDSV students, some of the MDSV students also may have studied, but um, maybe there was less, relatively less pressure um, on on passing one of the two quizzes as um, to make sure that. Uh, I'm not sure if the if the restriction is still there. Um, you have to pass one of the two quizzes for a given course in order to pass the course. Um, so yeah, that that definitely added a lot of pressure. And I think the saving grace for for me personally was having um, deadlines on sun on Saturday at at six p.m. Um, that was really like a forced break um, for Saturday night and 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 Sunday during the day. I'm somebody who will just keep working to the deadline if it's if, if, if the deadline is later. So it, like ha being forced to, you know, turn off your screen um, and, you know, go outside or like go, go see even like a friend or just hang out with your roommate or just turn your brain off. That was, that was really important, um, especially in the later blocks um, uh, in the wintertime because the, the material can be pretty arduous. So. Right. So I'm going to come back to Celine now and we talked about how difficult things may um, were and, um, one aspect of that difficulty is, and um, you don't have to respect, restrict yourself to what was difficult about it, but um, there's some curiosity um, about what, what your day looked like. You know, what do you get up? What, you know, what are you doing mm -hmm. 
at nine o'clock? Are you in a course? Are you studying? What is what does that look like? Um, so we start the day on a regular day. There's no quiz day. We start the day at nine o'clock. Uh, we have two classes in the morning, so it goes till twelve o'clock, and then we have a break till two o'clock. And starting from two o'clock to four p.m. is uh, um, it's a lab session. And then after that, it will be um, depends on the day. There will be a couple of uh, TA, TA, TA office hours, um, so you can just attend based on your time schedule. Um, during the lectures in the morning session, some of the instructor prefer uh, prefer prefer uh, prefer the way that um, student can pre-watch the you know recorded video that they put up online earlier, and then really use the lecture session to um, have a QA session to answer student questions. Um, some of the instructor prefer to just um, uh, uh, play the recording that they, they have pre-recorded during the lectures. Um, in the lab sessions, really, um, we have different breakout rooms. So each breakout room's number corresponds to the lab questions that had listed on the, um, in the questions. Um, so you can just, whatever question you're currently working on or have questions, you can just jump to that breakout room and there will be TA and then the instructor going, going, um, going through different rooms to help you, understand, uh, help you answer the questions. Um, yeah, so that's like uh, the, the day that I attend the school, uh, the time I attend school. Um, besides that, um, uh, students normally have to work on assignments probably till like 10 or 12, depends on, uh, uh, depends on their schedule. I tend to finish all the assignments um, um, by 10 p.m. so I can take a break. Um, but I also use some of the time um, in the afternoon off to do something else as well. I, I think the online course, online schedule is quite flexible. So if you have something really urgent to do, you can just pause the video and then do something else. And then, you know, just, just watch the pre-recordings again um, based on your schedule. Yeah, I've understood that uh, it's not necessary because there are people now who are in very different time zones. So it's not mm -hmm. totally necessary to be in Pacific uh, no. time to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So um, if you can't attend the lectures, you can always uh, uh, watch the pre recorded video, including the QA sessions that are scheduled on the you know regular um, uh, cl uh, classic schedule. Um, yeah, so also the qu for the quiz, um, I, I heard like, I heard that previously there was only one quiz time, like a schedule, um, a schedule maybe in the morning or in the afternoon according to Vancouver time, but currently we have two quiz time, one in um, like uh, in the morning session at eight o'clock and in another one is at 9 p.m. So I think it's, this kind of schedule is kind of cater to students like located to different time zones. So, which is quite nice. Mm -hmm. So, um, Kamal and, and Jonathan, how does that differ from the schedule? Because I, I think there will be, it's likely that there will be some things that will be maintained from this virtual 2020 way of doing things. But I think the, for the most part, the intent is to go back to the pre-2020 way of doing things. So what differences did you hear between what Celine was describing and what you uh, what, what you lived at uh, the beginning in 2019? Um, I think uh, office hours and TA hours were very challenging for us because um, sometimes it would just happen that because some courses we were doing with MDSV, their schedules used to be very different. So if we have, uh, we used to have clashing TA hours, so you ended up having to choose which PA to go to and which is more important. So I think that was a little, yeah, I, I don't think that was very favorable for most of us. I think with the online session, that's something which is, has a workaround to it. So that's good to hear. Jonathan, otherwise, did you feel like the, the different hours that Celine was describing is more or less the way that, that you're uh, your workday was going, or do you see big differences there? Um, the differences that for for this year's cohort, it sounds like I I would have appreciated those um, maybe more flexible um, hours. Yeah, because like like Kamal um, was saying, the having the clashing office hours uh, on certain weeks would end up being quite significant to how that week's work would go. Um, usually, the, 
courses were tend to have you know varying levels of difficulty on on various weeks and um when we when we had to study a little bit um on top of the studying that we had to do for um our quizzes and whatnot um personally i there was certain cases where i would have to miss a course lecture or a portion of the course lecture because i wanted to finish up um some studying for a quiz at a certain time so so having a bit more flexibility um would definitely be helpful because and and you know this is based on like my study schedule or when i like to get work done is very different from some of the other students some of the other students like to stay up late into the night some people like to stay up in the morning that sort of thing so um i guess catering towards everyone's different work schedules um that that sounds beneficial for for students especially in other time zones of course yeah i agree um um i think um in terms of accessing the instructors um you can always um send them the message on slack and they will just reply you within a very reasonable time frame but if probably i don't know maybe if you're on campus you want to ask a question to the instructor how i guess you, you guys can still use the slack right I see. okay okay yeah. yeah we we use slack but um there was often times where a certain ta or a certain instructor would be in charge of multiple office hours so mm-hmm. at a certain time period they would only be taking questions for a certain course um which oh, kind of okay. hindered our ability to especially if there was you know a particular lab problem that was causing like everybody problems sort of thing yeah. like everyone would be kind of like coming for a certain problem but that time is reserved for a different course um so there's always like those logistic things that obviously like you know i i'm sure that the program like did their best and and, and throughout the time like we we always felt like very supported it's just, you know these things of scheduling which which happens so yeah I, I also, think, also um, I feel like um, I think a significant chunk of our time was just like going from one end of the campus to the other like from Buchanan Tower to Nest again and then like yeah I think that is something that's time saved with the online thing so yeah I think is, that way it's very advantageous how UBC campus forced you to get some exercise yeah <laughs> <laughs> um I wanted to ask Celine because you were talking about how you connect with um instructors, TAs, professors within the program. Um now that things are all online, how have you been connecting um with uh with other other folks within the program, other students within the program? Is it mostly through Slack? Have you made a lot of connections with people? Uh definitely, but so far I haven't seen um a, a classmate in person. Um but there is definitely a huge amount of interactions online um for academic question i normally just uh, put a put put a slack questions um on um on 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 slack um i think the stu- um for other general question about academics i also post on slack so um uh, students um i think the students of this whole are, are very friendly they they're trying to answer your questions and give you a lot of suggestions um and um, besides using slack um uh, uh, we also have a like a, a wechat group for chinese students self organized one so what we do is that we talk uh, we talk about um uh, lab questions a lot um and normally before quizzes time we self organized review sessions um just one student um lead the lead the discussion and maybe just uh, generally going through all the course materials and the objective of that lecture and then going through the practice quizzes and then trying to help answer the questions in the end and um yeah i think it's a really really um uh pleasure experience so far for me yeah but hopefully we can see each other in the winter breaks somehow yeah that's great um i had a question so all of you expressed an interest in working with text data um and you were saying that before the course you were doing a lot of uh studying about programming and that how did you find the linguistics concepts once you got into the into the masters course were they difficult to pick up did you have to do some study outside of class in order to get yourself up to speed with with linguistics concepts uh, let's start with kamal um so i guess with the linguistics uh, concepts they uh, built up very gradually some of them were difficult like but we also had a lot of support for those i remember one of our tas was extremely supportive like he would uh, hold um 
different set of office hours just like for everybody to catch up so i think they are a little challenging at first if you don't have a linguistics background but you can get there i mean with the program yeah from the from some of the classmates in our cohort who had a linguistics background it seemed like the linguistics concepts that were addressed were fairly easy um for somebody who's familiar with it um i i personally had um a fair bit of uh struggle with it in the beginning um so yeah like like kamal said ha- having the tas and the instru- lab instructors they they arranged like crash course sessions for um certain linguistics concepts that would be used in the um in the actual lab assignments and that was um i would say pretty instrumental for for me personally anyway and, and maybe kamal too um to understand some of these because having no um i i i personally wasn't um preparing so much for the linguistics side of it um when i was preparing for this program but some of the concepts are actually quite in depth so um having that additional support from the teaching staff was 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 very important for me um i don't have too much to say but so far the two blo- blocks of classes are kind of overlap with the v program so i haven't touched too much into the linguistic part Um, so I wanted to talk also about something that Celine hasn't, um, hasn't gotten into quite yet, but it will be a nice uh, preview for her maybe, which is uh, talk about moving to talking about the uh, capstone portion of things and then also the career portion of things. So we've talked about uh, collaboration with, with classmates. What was it like working because the, for the capstone project, um, you got to you have to give input on which capstone project you were given. You basically get to select it, but it's not one to one. But once you selected um, that capstone project, what was it like to work with people together on that that project, Jonathan? I think the capstone project was um, one of the key takeaways, or the like, I guess the big lessons from this program, um, in that learning how to solve these problems throughout the, the coursework um, is like you, you start to develop certain tendencies and, and um, like solving these problems by yourself. Um, sometimes that can go out, out the window when you're trying to combine your code with other people. Like that can be very, very difficult. And, I, and I've, heard, I've heard and also experienced myself um, thinking that you're very, very confident in a certain like style of coding or like it works for you. Um, and to make the final product when you're combining it, that that might be what you end up spending the most, most of your time on is combining the code, making it work together and that sort of thing. So um, that was definitely beneficial to learn how to like integrate your code, um, how to adjust to other people's coding styles. Um, that was like really important. And, and from my friends who are um, working uh, in like industry, like very intensive industry roles, like, or even working as software developers, that seems like a lesson that is um, you're always working on. And that's really important to kind of, get exposed to in this program. Kamal, what, how did you feel about the, the capstone? I think uh, it's just as Jonathan said, um, I felt like a huge learning uh, experience was how to develop software like collaboratively. Uh, during the labs, we were, do, we, we, we were working mostly on Jupyter notebooks, but uh, to actually build a product, we had to all collaboratively work on the same code base. So I think that was a key experience for me personally. So yeah, that is something that the Capstone project will give you. And so Celine, what is it that you're, are you looking forward to the Capstone project? Was that something that attracted you to the course or are you maybe dreading it? <laughs> Hope not. Uh-huh. Uh, I think uh, the Capstone part is definitely a big selling point for this program. Um, and it's one of the uh, like a, one of the biggest reasons I choose the program, I'm definitely looking forward to kind of uh, um, maybe build a product that can ship eventually ship to the, the real customers yeah. in the end. Yeah, definitely very excited. Um, and uh, Kamal, I, I wanted to ask with regards to your capstone project, um, what was it that attracted you to the project that you did? If you want to tell us about what it was that you did in your capstone, that would be great. And then I'm also curious, um, if you were to select a project again, would you be looking for different different things in the project that you chose? Because there's 
you know, we had last year, I think at least 15 possible projects and people had yeah. to vote on what they were going to do. And um, different people were attracted by different things. So uh, yeah, if you could tell us about your project, what you thought was great, and then what you might have changed if you had a chance to pick a, a new project and why. Sure. Um, so basically, I did my capstone project with uh, Computer Research Institute Montreal. So they had a very interesting project where they were uh, utilizing uh, large-scale text corpuses and they were building a different kind of a data exploration tool, which was based on word vector embeddings. That was something that I was already interested in. And I felt like this was challenging enough. And at the same time, I would get to actually work on a project f from, like the, from the very beginning, like from the scratch. So we got to work with a lot of text data and in a domain that I was already interested in. So that's basically why I went for CRIM. Also, our mentors were researchers themselves. So I knew that I would have a lot of learning to take away from it. And if I had to choose something else, I, I think there were a few very interesting projects uh, in the mining industry. So that's something that I don't have a personal experience in, but it seems very interesting. So I would have gone for those. Yeah. Jonathan, what, how did you yeah. feel about your project? What attracted you to it? What might you have chosen differently? Yeah, so um, yeah, my capstone project was with Better Dwelling. Um, it's a, a company in Toronto um, that well, our project was to scrape uh, Canadian news, um, financial news, and um, perform sentiment analysis and ultimately make a, um, a sentiment analysis like a visualization um, app. So we could visualize um, the new sentiment of certain financial concepts like interest rate, um, mortgage rate, housing prices, and uh, correlate them um, with the actual performance of that uh, financial indicator. Um, so yeah, that for me, what attracted me to that, pro to that project was I guess the, the notion of building a project like end to end kind of like Kamal briefly touched about it, but um, starting from like scraping um, the, the, the actual text data and then performing sentiment analysis and then building the, the visualizations for that project. Um, developing it, in the coursework, we kind of, we, we, we focus on certain pieces at different times. Um, so putting it all together was kind of really, really interesting. Um, if I had to pick a project again, I mean, there were certain projects that were maybe a bit closer, like closer to my um, particular interests of the environment. Um, I know that UBC Urban Data Lab, they, they pitched a project um, for our year and maybe they'll be pitching um, this coming year too. Um, but yeah, like how the nature of, of, of the linguistics, um, computational linguistics skills that we develop in this program is that they're very interdisciplinary. So seeing what, skills are applied to multiple areas um, is like part of the, the fun of like seeing what skills we can kind of take in, into the many areas that we're interested in. So and um, Celine, sorry, sorry, Jonathan, I wanted to get Celine's, uh, what are you looking forward to? What, what is your dream capstone project and what do you hope to take from it? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a dream project yet. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that there is going to be challenging and interesting projects that's coming um, in the summertime. But I think one of the most, uh, one of the points that interests attract me in the pro um, Capstone project is that we got the experience of, uh, you know, using the real data that are actually is, um, generating from the real customers. Um, I, um, I think that's kind of valuable. Um, um, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's what we're looking for now. Yeah, and we um, we really make sure that the students have something to show for the project that they do afterward that they can take mm -hmm. to an interview and say, "Hey, look, I actually did something with real data." Yeah. So it's not just theoretical skills; they're real skills that you've applied. And with that, um, I wanted to talk about because uh, um, Jonathan uh, Kamal, you're on the you're on the job market now. Um, I know that there might be a bit of uh, concern among people watching this video about what the job market's like in, in 2020. Um, and so are you, are you finding, are there job advertisements up that you're seeing? Are you getting interviews? What are you finding? I'll throw it to Kamal first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, I think uh, the pandemic has definitely uh, slowed down the stream of interviews. Like a few months from now, I could see that there weren't just as many listings in Vancouver, especially. And I think as we are progressing, those are increasing, but it's definitely not at the same as before pandemic. So that's something that I would like to share. And yeah, I think, but coming back to the point that NLP is very in demand. So I've seen the interviews that I do get are more for my NLP skills as compared to my general data science skills. So that really helps. Oh, that's great to hear. Jonathan? Yeah, so the pandemic has definitely affected um, the, like the, the job search process and, and how many prospects it seems like that are out there. Um, from the friends that I talked to, uh, it seems like it's about 50-50 uh, of the friends that have found um, work and who are, are still looking. And a lot of that has to do with, with external factors, um, whether they were applying to other places in Canada, um, whether or not they're willing to relocate to America. There's um, a few friends have found work, but um, ultimately need to relocate to America. So that's um, maybe kind of difficult depending on, on, on what re restrictions you have in, um, for yourself. And, um, but yeah, I would say that it's still in demand. It's, it's funny, one of our instructors kind of remarked how um, to stay in Vancouver might be uh, fairly tough. Um, it's pretty competitive, but um, the market in Toronto was relatively much um, better. So uh, yeah, the, how COVID affects where you're willing to look and, and where you're, um, what job boards you're looking at, that sort of thing. Um, it has taken a hit, like I will admit, um, but um, there are jobs if you keep looking, like it seems like even friends at MDSV, uh, they're also finding that they're having to look a bit longer and that's just might be something that you have to kind of manage and, and deal with getting used to like the, the grind of it, I guess. Yeah, I can say that um, as the careers person, I uh, talking with the folks on the MDSV side that the careers have definitely been slower. We don't have an earlier cohort to compare with for MDSCL. Um, but I think relative to, to most fields, the fact that uh, about 50% or over 50% of our graduates have something right now is probably not a, a bad sign, especially for, for 2020. Um, uh, yeah, so with regards, we have uh, a number of people who are, who are working at Amazon, people who are working at startups, uh, fintech um, type, type things. So there's lots of, it, um, as Jonathan was saying, um, it, it will really depend on what industries you're willing to work in, where you're willing to work. Maybe you really want to live in Vancouver and pay a million dollars for your house, so that it'll cost you. <laughs> but uh, Celine, um, are you happy that, that you decided to, you know, career-wise, do you think this is the right year to be upgrading your skills or, or what are your feelings? Oh, I think this is definitely the year I um, is the right choice, the right decision for me to go back to school and improve and recharge myself. Um, I think, um, um, well, based on some of uh, several of my student tours visiting um, some of the giant tech company, um, I have learned that conversational AI are like one of their major focus in the next five or seven years, Ellis. Um, I definitely feel that there is a great um, future um, in this industry. Um, also, I know that um, um, across, uh, across different provinces in Canada, um, BC is a province that's like more AI uh, applied uh, driven provinces, while Montreal and Toronto are more, though they still have um, applied applications, um, uh, applic apply side of the you know corp, uh, business and running there in AI field, um, but they're really more focused on research type of um, um, research type of focus. So um, I definitely feel that there's a great gap between you know uh, the current research outcome as well as um, and um, the business use case, the business application. So I felt like this program can definitely um, point me to the right directions and maybe get get me started into. Um, contribute to the, you know, building AI applications in, in the province. I, I speak with a lot of organizations and I find that there's a big, um, there's, I mean, broadly two, two flavors. Organizations that are already using AI, in which case they say, oh yeah, tell me more about this program. This is the kind of students we need. But there are a lot of organizations where 
they've got mountains of text data that has a lot of value in them. For example, companies that design big machines tend to have lots of error logs. This isn't something they put up on Google. They've got mm -hmm. mounds and mounds of data and they don't have anyone to go through and find out that there's one part, part maybe that's always breaking down or something. So there are all sorts of applications, um, yeah. applications like that. Um, just looking, make sure that there's of course tons of questions here. I wanna make sure that I get all of them. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you, you know, of course um, we are the representatives, uh, well, certainly I'm representative of the MDSCL. Um, and so we are of course trying to show the, the program in a positive light, but I think it's, it's important also for students. Um, are you aware of, of students or, or talked with people who are thinking of applying to the program uh, and they want to get this degree in order to do something. And then you think, well, no, this degree is not for, I mean, certainly it won't turn you into um, uh, certain types of kind of hard, if you want hardcore programmers, but are there any, are there any words of caution that you would give this program is not for X, X or Y, uh, Kamal, what do you think? Is there something that you would not recommend this program for? Um, I think just like over LinkedIn, a few people have reached out to me and I think one of the recurring themes has been that, uh, it's not a research focused program. Right. So I think that is one thing that people should keep in mind while considering there won't be research elements, but you will be working with, um, like, like I said about transformers, it's very transformers and GPT, all, all of these things are very new and upcoming. So you do learn about them, but you're not going to go very deep into those concepts. So if that's what somebody is looking for, then maybe you should consider some other program. I'll add, if you're, if you're interested in the research end of things, then you should still reach out and contact us because maybe um, there's something for you to do within uh, the MA or within MSC program at, at UBC, yeah. because there is definitely research going on, but excellent point. Celine, did you have anything to add? What What is the program not? Oh, I was just going to add a comment. If you're really um, into uh, want to do a site project, research type of project, I think UBC has great resources like um, uh, work learn program um, or careers online, which they all sometimes offer opportunities that you can help with a postdoc, or a PhD or a professor, which you can do a kind of a short term type of research project. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment. I, uh, I know of a couple of students who on finishing the program, they were interested in participating in a research program. And so they reached out and, and did a bit of, of research with, with this uh, researcher in UBC linguistics. So there are, there are research opportunities, but it's not a core research program. Yeah, thanks, Celine. Jonathan. Yeah, so um, one thing about this program that I think that everyone should know is that uh, you, I, I don't think that anybody becomes an expert in the many topics that we address. I think that's like a good and bad thing of this program is that it's very quick in 10 months. Um, but certain topics, um, there is a fair bit of self-learning that you'll have to be doing to apply your skills and practice your skills. Um, when it comes to like as someone who didn't have a programming background um, before this program and after it, I feel very confident in my abilities to, to um, write code and to understand how code works. Um, but that being said, I still understand that I have like a lot more to learn. So it's, I would caution people thinking that after 10 months, like I'm done learning, like, like there's still more learning to do um, like, like in any program like this um, where you're learning very hard things. And um, yeah, and, and I, would, I would caution like any current students that if you're feeling like it's like it's very hard and I'm not understanding it, um, sometimes I don't think you're supposed to. Um, these things take a long time to learn and, and, and it's a gradual process. Um, you're learning a lot of very difficult things in 10 months. And um, if a couple concepts don't take yet, like that's okay. They're like these things, some of them have to take You'll get them long time. eventually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a wise, wise words. We're coming very close to the end. We've got just a minute left. Um, we're, there's gonna be an email in the chat. I think it's already there. So you can reach out if you have any, any further questions. Um, uh, also in case there's, there's something you're, you're interested in, in getting a little bit more information on. Um, 
thank you very much for tuning in today. And just as we go out, I'd like in maybe two senses, if possible, I want everybody to say their favorite thing about, about the program. We'll start as usual with Como. Um, my favorite thing was that um, just like from the academic perspective, it gave me like the complete package, like from software engineering to databases to an LP. So more, I think that's more that than two was... sentences. We'll say the complete package. Celine, yeah, two sentences. <laughs> Thanks, Kamal. Two sentences? Or one? Uh, oh, one sentence is um, I think the most favorite thing I like is the online discussion with uh, my cohort. Online discussion with the cohort and Jonathan. Yeah, yeah I think it'd be uh, mine would be just the network, the network of interesting, diverse um, people with different talents is, is really beneficial. And I think that I'll be, um, it'll definitely be helpful, um, like for years down the line. So yeah, I, very my beneficial. My problem is that I asked some linguists for two sentences and they know that they can make multi-clause sentences. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, on, on that note, I think we'll end things for today. Thank you so much for tuning in as ever. There's the um, email in the chat. So please do reach out to us. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, we're going to be having um, an admissions panel sometime in December. We look forward to interacting with you more then. Thank you very much to our panelists, Kamal, Celine, and Jonathan. Take care, everyone.